I just want to re-emphasize that breast is best. Um, so breastfeeding is, um, for the infant, the most physiological form of nutrition. And that's something that, as pediatricians, we don't really need to be reminded of. But uh, uh, what um, Jonathan has also brought out in his um, prevention talk is that breastfeeding itself is probably not particularly preventive for the development of food allergies. And we see lots of infants with food allergy through breast milk, uh, as um, breast milk contains intact food proteins. And the content of food proteins in breast milk varies between mothers. And usually the peak um, levels are detected uh, two to three hours after ingestion of, for example, egg or cow's milk. When we treat cow's milk allergy, um, so we have to distinguish whether the baby is exposed to cow's milk through breast milk or directly uh, through the diet. So initially we would, um, uh, as a principle, encourage breastfeeding and try to play around with the maternal diet, but that can only be done within uh, certain reasons. So if it's one food and if it's for a limited period, if it's, uh, if it's supervised well by a dietitian, then that's maybe sustainable. But sometimes we are in a situation where breastfeeding either is not possible or where we have to move to, um, to treatment formulas. And then you see the range uh, of formulas that we have available, either the extensively hydrolyzed formulas, amino acid-based formulas, and in some cases soy, and that's an area um, that's still um, uh, debated. And later when the baby is on a diet itself, um, it also has to avoid certain foods. In the treatment, I'm going to again divide it between IgE-mediated cow's milk allergy and non-IgE-mediated cow's milk allergy because the treatment principles are very different. With the treatment of IgE-mediated cow's milk allergy, safety again is at the forefront because we see immediate reactions, potentially anaphylaxis, which can be life-threatening. So as, uh, as an allergist or as a gastroenterologist, if you look after an infant with IgE-mediated cow's milk allergy, cow's milk avoidance, cow's milk protein avoidance has to be strict. Some parents misconceive cow's milk allergy as lactose intolerance, and they put their babies on lactose-free formulas. Obviously, that's not appropriate because lactose-free formula is um, uh, intact cow's milk and, um, and would therefore not be suitable. So the first thing is um, to provide parents with education about immediate type food allergy, and this is what we use in Australia. Parents get um, this um, anaphylaxis treatment plan, which outlines exactly how to respond to um, the various forms of allergic reactions. I'm not sure what, whether something similar is available here in Argentina. So parents get to told about mild to moderate reactions with swelling of the lips, face, uh, of the eyes, hives, tummy pain, vomiting, all of that as mild to moderate reactions, um, and then the, the warning signs of anaphylaxis, and if these babies have an EpiPen, then also how to use the EpiPen. So there, there is a, um, with the strict avoidance of cow's milk protein, obviously there is um, a lot of education involved, and we usually try to involve a dietitian in, in this education process. And the better the education for the parents, the higher uh, also the success of avoiding um, accidental reactions. Um, the adrenaline auto-injector, the EpiPen, uh, is provided to children that we deem at high risk of severe um, allergic reactions. And this is not just limited to cow's milk, this applies to any food allergy. And um, this is a little bit different, so uh, Jonathan might have different practice because litigation is much more common in America, so they, uh, American physicians will err more on the side of caution and provide an EpiPen more freely. In Australia, we are a little bit um, protected, so we, we probably are um, more restricted or restrictive. So we would only provide an EpiPen if, if a patient has already had anaphylaxis, then it's very clear cut. Or if a patient has unstable asthma, which is a, a risk factor for severe allergic reactions. So if you have, for example, as a teenager, unstable asthma and have an accidental reaction, you're more likely to have anaphylaxis. If you live remotely, and this probably applies to Argentina like Australia or like the States, some patients are very isolated and um, probably don't get medical care in a timely fashion, so they should probably have an EpiPen. And those who have um, uh, um, allergic reactions after five years of age often have more severe reactions, and, and they should be given the EpiPen, which comes in two strengths, um, one for um, the weight 10 to 20 kilos and then uh, 20 kilos and above. 
So um, if you have an EpiPen, you need to be told how to use it. You have to get an anaphylaxis plan. And in Australia, we have anaphylaxis legislation. All carers um, and um, teachers have to be trained in the use of the EpiPen. And that's something that um, is, uh, has just been, um, that actually started in Victoria, um, probably through our hospital. So IgE-mediated food allergy is, is fairly straightforward. Um, I just want to um, give you a reminder um, about the different um, formula choices that we have. And um, in view of the World Cup, I thought I'd make it relevant. So um, pa partially hydrolyzed formula um, has large protein fragments. So the, the protein is very coarsely um, chopped up into large fragments. But these fragments um, are still large, so you need about eight, of, uh, eight amino acid, uh, acids as an epitope to be recognized still as cow's milk protein. So this is easily read as cow's milk by the immune system still. Then we have extensively hydrolyzed formula with small proteins, uh, small peptides, but still despite filtration with some um, contamination with larger peptides, again, which uh, accounts for residual um, allergenicity. And it's only the amino acids, acid, the free amino acids, which are completely synthetic, which are not made from cow's milk, but um, so this is cow's milk free and has um, no risk of contamination. And if you look at it by beta lactoglobulin content, which is the, um, one of the main whey proteins, you can see an intact cow's milk and lactose free milk would just be the same. You have um, bucket loads of bovine beta lactoglobulin and the partially hydro hydrolysides have a drop-off by about four log um, scales, um, so much less beta-lactoglobulin, but still large amounts, and that's why they're not hypoallergenic. And it's only when you get to extensively hydrolyzed formula, um, this is when, uh, when the formula becomes hypoallergenic. And uh, I tend to think of extensively hydrolyzed formula at the same level of allergen content uh, con compared to human milk. So you still have residual allergenicity um, for, for, for both of these. And only when you move to an amino acid-based formula, um, it is completely non-allergenic. So what are the treatment choices when we think about avoiding cow's milk? There's this whole list of um, different um, formulas available, and you can see here from other mammalian milk, soy, partially hydrolyzed, extensively hydrolyzed, amino acid-based. They're all possibilities that people think about. But by process of elimination, it actually narrows down quite quickly. Other mammalian milks are very homologous in their protein um, composition, so more than 90% homologous or 95%, so goat and sheep are therefore not suitable because they cross-react um, with cow's milk and, are, uh, and should therefore not be used. Um, soy formula is more controversial, and I said um, uh, that earlier because um, the European uh, uh, Espergan guidelines still say that soy should not be used uh, in infants under six months. This is um, uh, depending on funding models quite strongly because there's obviously a cost issue involved. And in Australia, there's currently um, debate whether we can bring in soy formula earlier, but we usually use soy as a step down rather than a step up um, formula. So. Ideally um, restricted to infants over six, but occasionally used in, uh, in infants under six months. Partially hydrolyzed formula, I've already said, is not uh, a treatment formula, although it sometimes is used in that context. For example, in Thailand, um, I, I visited there earlier um, a few years ago, where uh, extensively hydrolyzed formulas were not available, and they were using partially hydrolyzed formula as a treatment formula, and it works sometimes. It might work in 10 or 20% of cases, but it's not ideal and it's not always safe, so we, we don't recommend it to use in that way. So partially hydrolyzed formula maybe has a role in prevention but doesn't have a role in treatment. So really the, um, the treatment formulas are extensively hydrolyzed casein or whey predominant formulas or amino acid based formulas. And we think of these formulas in a pyramid or a, in a hierarchy. So at the bottom you have the um, parent initiated formulas, cow's milk, lactose free, partially hydrolyzed and maybe soy. Um, and then a physician in initiated would be extensively hydrolyzed and amino acid based um, at the top as the most restricted, most expensive and uh, most advanced formula in that respect. 
but we don't always need to escalate to that level, and that's what I'm uh, trying to cover now. So, so extensively a hydrolyzed formula is pretty much the default for many of the syndromes, but there are clear indications where we have to go straight to amino acid-based formula. And the choice of formula then is, um, is governed by, um, firstly, to look at efficacy and the best clinical outcomes. That's our main priority. But we also have to um, take into account palatability. So some infants won't drink certain formulas, and that's when we are stuck, because if the baby refuses, then um, it's either a nasogastric tube, which is often not attractive, or you have to try something else that's maybe better tasting. Um, availability, obviously, um, so, so um, some people bring in uh, formulas on eBay or via the internet, but that's, again, not ideal. So availability, obviously, is a rate limiting step. Cost and funding models um, are also governing how we can use these formulas. And, and um, I understand here with private insurers, there may also be certain limitations on what you can prescribe. Um, I'm just going to go through um, a guideline um, that came out of um, the World um, Allergy Organization in 2010, which is called the um, DRACMA guideline, which is short for Diagnosis and Rationale Against Cosmic Allergy, which was a, um, a multidisciplinary uh, panel um, through the World Allergy Organization who came up with this global guideline. And it's, a, it's the first guideline that was very comprehensive. It's, a, it's over 150 pages. And uh, I'm just going to give you the essentials of this uh, guideline. It's, it was based on um, a meta-analysis of the so-called GRADE um, system. So it's something that is based on the best available um, uh, evidence that we have, and, and also highlighting that our, the evidence is actually quite limited. And then this is the guideline. And I would encourage you to, uh, if you have access, um, to, to look through that guideline, because it is very detailed. and. Uh, um, it probably has a lot of uh, background information that might also be useful that uh, is beyond the scope for this talk, maybe. So just uh, on the topic of cow's milk protein elimination, um, the, the goals really are cow's milk elimination to the extent that clinical remission is induced. And for IgE-mediated cow's milk allergy, that has to be very strict. But for non-IgE-mediated cow's milk allergy, sometimes the thresholds are actually different. And small amounts, for example, of baked cow's milk, so in, in, in muffins, or um, small amounts as trace ingredients in a processed food might be tolerated. Um, that's very different to IgE-mediated cow's milk allergy, where the thresholds usually are much lower and where reactivity is much more severe. And that's why IgE and non-IgE can be different. So we want to in, uh, remit um, symptoms, and we also have to educate parents um, carefully to um, prevent accidental reaction. That will obviously also depend on labeling, how good your labeling is in your country, and how good parents are at identifying foods. Um, and also um, avoid uh, cross-reacting pro proteins from other mammalian milks. Um, the diet has to be sustainable, so you have to make sure that the parents are not overly restricting calories or other micronutrients, and we need a dietitian sometimes to help us with that. And um, so this is a, a huge educational um, undertaking. We, we do have problems, and uh, problems arise when th there's breakdown in communication or when there's insufficient education, when there's poor labeling or when there are misunderstandings. So, Oops, sorry. So um, some parents uh, understand that maybe partially hydrolyzed formula may be a suitable source or lactose-free or A2 milk, which is a low beta lactoglobulin milk that we have available in the southern hemisphere, like in New Zealand and Australia. Um, other problems are what I alluded to, taste aversion that babies won't drink the partially hydrolyzed formula, uh, the extensively hydrolyzed formula or amino acid-based formula, so we might have to either intervene early or um, get the baby used by using um, t taste modifiers and sweeteners or um, other um, additives. And then we also have to look at, um, uh, at other allergies because people with uh, babies with cow's milk allergy often are also allergic to other things like egg or nuts. Um, I, and I want to just briefly uh, give you a framework of how maternal elimination diets work. 
So maternal elimination diets have a risk because um, if mothers uh, in Australia, mothers already initiate these diets before they see a um, medical practitioner. So maternal diets are often poorly supervised and the diet might become very narrow and may actually jeopardize the nutritional quality of the breast milk. So we advocate um, elimination diets, maternal elimination diets, mainly for three conditions. One is atopic dermatitis, usually as a marker of IgE-mediated food allergy. Allergic proctocolitis, so that's the baby with rectal bleeding, and babies with severe infantile colic, uh, with the um, emphasis on severe, not for minor symptoms. And um, the, the process is really to work through a, while the mother continues breastfeeding, to not have any cow's milk protein for two weeks or up to four weeks, and then to reassess um, whether there was improvement or not. The, the reflex often when there was an improvement is that parents tend to, or mothers tend to t broaden the diet more and more until the diet becomes very unsustainable. So we usually like to limit it to cow's milk and if there's eczema, we would also eliminate egg. And this is based on the ESPGAN guideline, which came out um, uh, seven years ago now. At some stage, then, uh, this has to be challenged by reintroduction cow's milk protein. If symptoms recur, then the mother remains on the elimination diet until either tolerance develops or if the baby needs to be weaned onto to something, the um, European guideline suggests weaning onto an extensively hydrolyzed formula. If no symptoms recur after cow's milk reintroduction, then um, the, after a period of time, egg can maybe also be reintroduced. So egg, I, I see more as a marker for babies with or without eczema. So if there's eczema, then egg might also be useful. The important thing is that um, when you take out dairy, you also take out the main calcium source from the diet. So um, you have to monitor the maternal protein and calcium intake, and usually we put the mothers on a calcium supplement of 1.2 grams per day in divided doses. So not as one big dose, but with, in small aliquots uh, with food. That's the important recommendation. Importantly also, soy intake is often tolerated by the mothers. Um, so often mothers start a cow's milk and soy-free diet and we would not usually require that. The other thing is um, if the baby is tolerating, so the baby has had cow's milk allergy diagnosed but does not react to breast milk even if the mother maintains cow's milk, then there's no need for an elimination diet. So we would gauge the need for an elimination diet only if the baby is reacting to breast milk. So if the baby is just reacting to external cow's milk, but not to breast milk, then there's no need for maternal elimination. Just going back to the treatment formulas, the DRACMA guidelines distinguish two scenarios for IgE-mediated food allergy, high risk of anaphylaxis and low risk of anaphylaxis. If you had high risk of anaphylaxis, and that is defined as um, prior history of anaphylaxis um, or and currently not using extensively hydrolyzed formula. So that's when they say, so the baby has had either had anaphylaxis recently and, and you don't know whether another formula is tolerated, then as an interim you put the baby on an amino acid based formula until you can clarify in the controlled setting whether extensively hydrolyzed formula is tolerated. And that will cover again the small, against the small risk of having anaphylaxis to extensively hydrolyzed formula. So that's a very cautious approach. Again, because it's a grade recommendation, it will take into account that the evidence th that this recommendation is based on is actually quite, um, quite poor. Uh, so it's a conditional recommendation of very low quality. So that's, but that's a little bit like most um, uh, Cochrane reviews or, or um, similar reviews, that we never have conclusive or very strong recommendations. So this is probably the best we have, although we know we, we, we need more data, really. If there's a low risk of anaphylaxis, then the default is really um, uh, extensively hydrolyzed formula. So... Uh, with IgE, it's very straightforward. If you think this baby has had anaphylaxis or is at very high risk of anaphylaxis, then you use um, amino acid-based formula and then try to, to step down. 
or otherwise the default is um, extensively hydrolyzed formula with the view maybe to stepping down to soy or uh, trialing cow's milk again uh, later. The issue of soy uh, is, is controversial, as I said, and at the moment uh, there's no clear-cut recommendation. Um, there, there are more theoretical concerns about the quality of soy protein, about phytoestrogens and um, aluminium content and other um, autoimmune concerns. Um, but all of those are more theoretical concerns, and at the moment it's very unclear at what stage soy is a, um, so, a safe source of nutrition for infants. Um, the cautious approach still would be that soy is at least not your first choice in infants under six months. So in summary, for the IgE-mediated uh, forms of food, uh, cow's milk allergy in breastfed infants, a maternal elimination diet um, should be considered but is not always required. In formula-fed infants, um, you gauge the type of formula uh, according to the risk of anaphylaxis. So if there was anaphylaxis, then definitely firstly go with an amino acid-based formula and then step down in a controlled environment. Um, and obviously, um, you need to monitor patients. Once they're on treatment formulas, um, you need to ongoing monitoring needs to establish when tolerance has been achieved so that you then can introduce cow's milk once tolerant. And here again, this is um, a summary of the further research recommendations. You can just read that um, obviously the data that this is based on is not ideal and that we need more studies. In Australia, we've also tried to um, come up with a handle on um, how to best treat um, the non-IgE-mediated forms of cow's milk allergy. And, and that's much more difficult because the approach is actually quite diverse and it needs to take into account um, the different presentations that are presented in my first talk. Um, so this is a, a panel of um, Australian specialists and, and made up by, uh, from allergists and um, general pediatricians, neonatologists. So this is the Australian approach, and, but I think it, it is uh, providing a, a good framework and I think it's still valid and, and it's pretty much what we practice still. Um, so I'm just gradually going to uh, take you through the slide. I'm hope, I hope you can see what it says. Um, so what this is is um, the, the different clinical syndromes with the timing of reactions, whether maternal elimination diet is required, and then a first, second, and third choice of formulas. And that's a useful table that will probably help you. And if you have time, um, this... this um, article is um, freely available on the internet, so you can just um, maybe download it and, and follow this. Um, so the, the gastrointestinal manifestations start here with um, f pies food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome. Because it doesn't occur in breastfed babies, there's no need for a maternal elimination diet, so the mother does not, even when she's breastfeeding, does not need to modify her diet. Um, there, there are no documented cases of um, FPIs to extensively hydrolyzed formulas or, except for single case reports, but um, that's probably um, quite rare. So in general, an extensively hydrolyzed formula uh, in FPIs babies should be tolerated. Um, amino acid-based formula, second line, if there were unexpected rare reactions to extensively hydrolyzed formula. The other gastrointestinal syndromes with enteropathy or reflux-like symptoms or constipation or severe colic, again, um, these might respond to a maternal elimination diet. So uh, in those cases, um, cow's milk elimination from the maternal diet may be warranted or may be beneficial. And the treatment recommendation here would be for infants under six months to trial extensively hydrolyzed formula first in older infants soy, and then step up to the next level, either extensively hydrolyzed or amino acid-based formula. And for the babies with food protein-induced uh, uh, proctocolitis, sorry, the babies with rectal bleeding, if they're breastfed, then uh, try a maternal elimination diet. If they're formula-fed, then you would try first extensively hydrolyzed formula and step up to about uh, to amino acid-based formula, which may be required in, in about 10% of infants. And in eosinophilic esophagitis, it's the only situation where we would go straight to an amino acid-based formula because there are only studies uh, showing that amino acid-based formula is 
effective. There's one adult study that has shown that extensively hydrolyzed formula was also effective in a large proportion of patients. But at the moment in pediatrics, I think amino acid-based formula is still the default for this condition. So amino acid-based formula really is a step up from extensively hydrolyzed formula for most of the gastrointestinal reactions. So that's in 10 to 20 percent who don't tolerate the extensively hydrolyzed formula. For those with eosinophilic esophagitis, or for those who've had um, anaphylaxis. And that, that's just a summary um, saying exactly what I've just uh, shown you. Just a word on lactose-free um, formulas. Um, most treatment formulas are actually lactose-free, not just the lactose-free formula. So and that's where um, some of the confusion arises because um, you can treat lactose intolerance or lactose malabsorption with any of these formulas, not just lactose-free formula, but also soy formula, extensively hydrolyzed formula. We've got one with lactose now on the market, and amino acid-based formula. So sometimes the distinction, whether it's cow's megalogy or um, lactose intolerance, may seem esoterical because you can use any of these formulas to, to treat it. But obviously, if it's just lactose intolerance, um, the hypoallergenic formulas would be too costly and would be an over-treatment. Conversely, as I said, if you have cow's milk enteropathy with secondary lactose intolerance, lactose-free cow's milk-based formula is, is not the right choice. So that's the important distinction that you need to make. Um, there's a trend now um, to bring lactose as a prebiotic back into the treatment formulas because there's probably no real need for lactose restriction because once the gut has repaired, um, then uh, lactose should, should be rega lactase uh, should be regained. So, so there's now a trial, for, particularly for patients with uh, immediate type of reactions, to go back onto a lactose-containing uh, hypoallergenic formula, which also has a better taste because it's much sweeter. How long do babies need to stay on an elimination diet? Um, that's a little bit of a difficult question, and, and the, the natural history of food allergy is changing. So um, some of these infants might uh, stay on hypoallergenic diets for longer than previously. But usually, after the infants are two or three, we can package something that doesn't rely on um, a formula anymore. So the formula use is probably um, up to two years or maximum maybe three years. Uh, it's important to remember that prolonged elimination diets pr restrict other parts of the diet, so they they might may be associated with bad nutritional outcomes. So you want to keep the nutritional diets, uh, hypoallergenic diets, as narrow as possible, so as unrestricted as possible, and for as short a period as possible. And it's important that they are supervised because unsupervised elimination diets often uh, cause micronutrient deficiencies. Patients need to be reassessed regularly by either skin testing or food challenges to monitor for possible tolerance. And I've seen parents who um, disappeared from follow-up and, and these kids came back when they were nine or 10 on very limited diets and the, the food allergies had gone away long before. So it's very important that you don't lose your patients to follow up and, and, and monitor them until tolerance has developed. So I said here, dairy products often tolerated by two to three years, but um, for IgE-mediated food allergy, that may not always be the case, as we've heard. What are the complications um, of IgE-mediated food allergy? We've heard about anaphylaxis and immediate reactions. The complications of non-IgE-mediated gastrointestinal cow's milk allergy are mainly relating to poor growth. So growth failure as a factor uh, as a combination of factors due to poor feeding, persistent vomiting, and chronic diarrhea potentially. So three factors contributing to poor growth. We need to monitor for micronutrient deficiencies, mainly iron and also some of the trace elements, zinc and, uh, and vitamin D. And early treatment is paramount because babies with um, ongoing symptoms may develop aversive feeding behaviors, and, and uh, that, that's an important thing we need to prevent. I've seen babies who went into complete feeding refusal and needed um, nasogastric tubes and gastrostomies eventually. So these things can become very entrenched and it's important to get onto them uh, early before these things happen. Um, sleep pattern disturbance is another uh, complication that parents often get worn out by uh, because if babies cry all the time and sleep poorly, um, that can be set up by food allergies. But 
sometimes the food allergies have gone away and the babies still have poor sleeping behaviors. So, so we, we use the multidisciplinary team to, to work on feeding behaviors and sleep behaviors. And we um, have to sort of prevent family burnout. And, and um, as a gastroenterologist and allergist, you, you will know what I mean, that this becomes part of your, uh, becomes more important sometimes than managing the diet. So we use a multidisciplinary approach to share the load. Um, allergist, gastroenterologist, dietitian. We, ha we have a maternal child health nurse who helps with feeding issues, speech pathologists, and the social worker um, gets a fair share as well. It's important, um, as I said, to keep following your patients. So review your patients regularly. Um, involve neighboring specialties, involve a dietitian early before nutritional complications have occurred, screen for micronutrient deficiencies, and you see the list here, iron, zinc, folate, vitamin B12, vitamin D. Monitor growth parameters on the WHO growth charts. And consider your diagnosis if your patient's not improving, um, following up on my first talk, and provide social supports when needed. One of the things that happens, uh, and this is uh, more an observation, um, uh, a problem with elimination diets is that they can sometimes be overwhelming. And uh, you can see if you're already on a multi-food elimination diet for food allergy, some patients will have a second set of diagnoses, for example, celiac disease, and they're, they're also on a gluten-free diet, or they might be on a low FODMAP diet, which restricts carbohydrates in a, in a different way for, for, for gut-related um, pain. Or they might go on a low salicylate diet, or they may be on a vegan diet or vegetarian diet. Once you combine different allergic um, elimination diets, uh, uh, different elimination diets with a hypoallergenic diet, uh, there's not much left um, that you can have. So you have to try and undo these restrictions, and that's um, what I'm doing most of the time. Most of my patients come on very restricted diets, and my role is actually to relax these diets to reassure the parents that it's okay to bring foods back in. And that's often our role, rather than working the other way where we put restrictions in place. So to, to sum up, and I'm finishing a little bit early, uh, so treatment of um, cow's milk allergy in infancy is different for IgE-mediated and non-IgE-mediated cow's milk allergy. Uh, so, so for IgE-mediated cow's milk allergy, we need strict avoidance of all cow's milk protein, either eliminated from the maternal diet or by using specialized um, formulas, extensively hydrolyzed amino acid-based or soy in older infants. Breastfeeding should be continued, and that, that's something that we're quite serious about. So the maternal elimination diets might provide that um, avenue, but sometimes that's not possible. Um, the maternal elimination diets are mainly used for three conditions. Um, the, atopic dermatitis, usually due to IgE-mediated food allergy. Um, allergic proctocolitis, um, usually cow's milk and severe infantile colic, cow's milk, and sometimes uh, other foods as well. Um, the gastrointestinal food allergies are still complex uh, in their management and diagnosis, and um, they, they often require amino acid-based formula, particular if there's nutritional compromise. So if the patient is presenting early on with poor nutritional status, we would uh, escalate up to an amino acid-based formula um, very quickly. In patients who are not as severe, you have time on your side and often can work through an extensively hydrolyzed formula. The ex exceptions would be eosinophilic esophagitis. And finally, um, just a reminder to involve a dietitian and to invo involve a dietitian early to provide the um, right nutritional mix, but also to provide the education for parents, which is an important keystone in managing these patients. I might leave it there. Thank you.